Hey everybody, uh, I'm Dr. Scott Poole from the College of Charleston and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you a little bit from my lair uh, in my house uh, in the haunted attic here that I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour of later about the exciting exhibit at the Columbia Museum of Art the It's Alive exhibit which is wonderful and I do want to mention here at the outset that there's a number of resources that you can find at the museum site online. There's actually some great essays about um, everything from feminism and horror films to the idea of horror collecting. There's actually some other talks that you can take a look at. And of course, while you're there, you can become a member of the museum, uh, which would be a very good time to, to do. So do take a look at that after you hear about uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, um, the original plan was for me to actually be with you in person and talk about Children of the Night. Uh, that was my title taken from the 1931 film Dracula. And the subtitle was, How Did Americans Come to Love Horror? Americans have not always enjoyed horror. Uh, in fact, they saw it as something foreign. They saw it, they actually had a, ter a term for it that we use in a different context, weird. And so we're going to talk about how Americans went from talking about weird entertainments that they were a little bit nervous about to falling in love with the classic monsters that you could see at the exhibit, uh, the classic Universal Studios monsters like Lugosi's Dracula, Karloff's uh, Frankenstein, and of course, my friend here, Elsa Lanchester's The Bride of Frankenstein. So uh, I, here I am with my friend Count Orlock uh, in, from uh, Nosferatu 1922, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a moment. This was an incredibly influential film in Germany, in Europe more generally, in fact continues to influence horror greatly today. And the story of it actually tells us a little bit about why Americans were uncertain about horror. So before uh, I tell you a little bit more about Orlock and the story of Nosferatu, let me tell you about Americans and spooky stories before the 1920s and the 1930s. So Americans had always had a lot of uncertainty about horror, and that came in part from the idea that America was a forward-looking and optimistic nation, notions that dated all the way back to the revolutionary era that extolled uh, reason, progress, that saw the American Revolution itself as coming out of the Enlightenment. And so, for example, when you get into ghost stories in the 19th century, um, most American ghost stories are either one, humorous, or two, they are set in Europe. Uh, they're placed in Europe. And so, uh, even some of the great writers that we think of as the great 19th century ghost story writers of America, Ambrose Bierce, uh, and of course Edgar Allan Poe, uh, who really wasn't much of a ghost story writer, but that's a different story. He wrote in all kinds of different genres. But um, it, Bierce isn't really well known in the 19th century and before the First World War, and indeed not really until the 1920s and 30s. And Poe is actually much more popular in Europe than he is in the United States. It's not until the late 19th century that he begins to get a little bit of a reputation in, in, in the U.S. And so, whenever there was a film made, and there were a number of films made dealing with ghosts and spirits in particular, um, there was the Edison Film Company did make one uh, short film uh, that was very, very loosely based on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but told a very different and 
actually a much less macabre and, and gloomy kind of story than would come in the 1930s. But the tendency was to refer to these films as weird films, sometimes as weird mysteries. And the term horror itself was not used, in part because horror was connected with things that were gruesome, uh, with physical horror. It actually is a word that means a physical revulsion. And Americans tended to be very uncomfortable with that and tended not to want uh, to see supernatural stories that were not played for laughs. Now, we're, as we're going to see, this would continue even after the First World War. This is one of the most famous shots from the 1922 film Nosferatu. This is Nosferatu, Count Orlok, emerging off of the plague ship. Uh, the rats coming with him. Uh, if you had the chance to see uh, Nosferatu when uh, the art museum did a, a showing of it, you know that it's a very different kind of vampire story than the one that you, the ones that you are used to. For one thing, he's not a pretty vampire at all, is he? Uh, no, definitely not. And uh, not only that, but um, in, in Nosferatu, uh, he's not just sort of you know, biting one neck at a time. Uh, he is a plague. He is a contagion. He's referred to as the death bird, uh, in the, the Totenvogel uh, in German, uh, the idea of an overshadowing bird that brings the great death. There was a reason why that, that kind of imagery was used, and it, was, it had to do with uh, the director, F.W. Murnau, uh, and... Um, a gentleman who designed the scenery, wrote part of the script, uh, designed uh, the character of Count Orlok himself, um, set sort of the, the staging or, or the uh, uh, mise-en-scene. Uh, this was uh, Albin Graw. Uh, today we probably would call him the cinematographer of the film, but he played a much bigger role than that. And Graw and Murnau were both uh, affected deeply by and veterans of the Great War or World War I. And Graw in particular talked about how he wanted to invest Nosferatu with the imagery of the Great War, which he said was, and this is a, a, a quote uh, he used many times in talking about the film, the cosmic vampire that has taken the blood of millions. And, of course, he is drawing on his own experiences uh, in Serbia fighting with the Austro-Hungarian army. Uh, after W. Murnau also had a series of horrific experiences, both in the trenches and as an aviator. And uh, so they brought all of this into the great horror film Nosferatu. Um, these kinds of films did not have an impact in the United States right away. Uh, in fact, uh, when another uh, film very much influenced by the Great War, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, uh, appeared in the U.S. in the early 1920s, there were protests, uh, street protests, about the film being shown uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, American newspapers, a number of film critics, commented on how the film showed what they called European uh, European morbid ideas. And so there was the, the concept was at work in the American mind that weird stories, weird mysteries, uh, the, Euro the growing European tradition of horror was on the one hand very foreign, and America is becoming, at least in relation to Europe, very isolationist uh, and had always uh, had a sense of the foreign and the exotic as dangerous. So it's foreign, first of all. And second of all, there is something about the supernatural when it's played straight, when it's played for horror, that did not seem to fit the American spirit, at least in the way that uh, certain kinds of Americans, certain boosters of a certain vision of America saw it. And I'm going to talk about that with the next image. <laughs> 
There were about 166,000 American casualties from the First World War. This was, of course, disastrous. However, something very strange happened in the United States in 1918, 1919, and 1920. There was a general uh, amnesia about what had happened to the American veteran, and there was also this sense that, and, and this was reflected in the very real-world politics of the era, that the United States had emerged as one of the real victors of the Great War. Now, the U.S. may have been uh, one of only one or two nations that emerged out of that terrible carnage with this sense of itself. So, for example, uh, U.S. casualties when compared with the millions of casualties suffered by the Germans, the French, the Russians, the British, essentially every major power involved in the struggle were really quite small. And then on top of this, uh, American industry and American infrastructure actually benefited in certain respects from the war. And so you have American writers. Uh, so, for example, a, a, a po in a popular magazine, uh, a kind of uh, a, a kind of business boosting magazine, there was a discussion of how American monuments should not be. And here comes that word again: morbid. Uh, they should instead be cheerful. Uh, the right said the writer, and not ha because we are not a morbid people. And so you actually see this, uh, and, and, and you may say to yourself when you look at this image, oh, I've seen that before. Uh, I, you know, that is from my hometown, or that is from, you know, someplace I tried. The reason is this image, this statue, which was uh, sculpted by uh, E.M. Visquizny, uh, is called the Spirit of the American Doughboy. And it is consciously modeled on, first of all, the Statue of Liberty. It, is, it became the model for about 70 statues all around the country. And uh, it also is completely different from really any European memorial to the war. Most European memorials tended to be what are sometimes called utilitarian memorials. That is, they did not represent a soldier. They did not represent an image of a soldier. But instead, they often were gates, like uh, symbolic gates, like the Menon Gate in the city of Ypres. Uh, in Belgium, which was one of the most fought-over pieces of ground during the Great War for a, a four-year period. Uh, they tended to be sort of uh, essentially mass ossuaries, mass graves, uh, and have sometimes a listing of names, uh, but sometimes a simple uh, uh, superscription that read something like, to the Great War dead, an unknown soldier of the Great War, or simply unknown. And so uh, this sense of mass death, what in Nosferatu the filmmakers chose to call the Great Death, profoundly influenced the uh, interest in European horror. Uh, and the interest in European horror cinema on the continent. The United States, as you can see here, with the doughboy, the spirit of the American doughboy, charging forward. Uh, the, the American idea uh, was very different, and the American view of the 1920s was very different. There was a sen almost a sense in which they, uh, Americans did not want to think about the darkness and the carnage of the Great War. They wanted to look ahead and look beyond it. So the atmosphere was not right for horror in America. Now, there were films that dealt with the supernatural, weird films, but as I mentioned before, often these were played for laughs. This is an excellent example of this. Uh, this is uh, the silent film star Harold Lloyd, uh, who in 1920 
did a film called Haunted Spooks. And he, not unlike Charlie Chaplin, had kind of a trademark uh, physical humor, uh, what almost close to what we would think of as slapstick. Um, and in this particular story, uh, Harold Lloyd finds himself in a haunted mansion in the South, uh, in fact, um, or uh, as it's described humorously in an inner title in the film, uh, just take the, uh, take the Mississippi River and then hang a left. That's how uh, the South is, is described. And uh, Harold Lloyd runs into some, uh, a supposedly haunted house that, as often in these films, like the next one we'll talk about, um, it turns out not to be haunted at all. It's really what I call the Scooby-Doo explanation, the Scooby-Doo kind of film um, in which it's all played for laughs, it's all played for a spoof, and it turns out at the end that there was never a ghost all along. Although Harold Lloyd uh, has certainly gotten so frightened here uh, that his hair has quite literally stood on end. Uh, and so, uh, in this moment of general cultural optimism, this insistence that we are not a morbid people, even a ghost story, even a story called Haunted Spooks, uh, would only be played for laughs. This is a still shot from another film that is a lot like Harold Lloyd's um, Haunted Spooks, just from one of the other great stars of the silent film era. This is Buster Keaton, uh, who, again, like Lloyd, like Chaplin, was known for his physical humor and his slapstick. Um, in this particular tale, he's on the, uh, he's a bank clerk uh, who for some reason is on the trail of some bank robbers uh, who have hid out in a allegedly haunted house. And in fact, the 1920 film is simply called The Haunted House. Um, it is all played for fun. We learn at the end that the bank robbers have booby-trapped the house uh, in a kind of Home Alone sort of fashion so that uh, Buster Keaton will not be able to find them. There are a couple of moments in the film that actually are a, a little accidentally scary. Uh, <laughs> this is one of them. But again, it's a Scooby-Doo tale. Uh, the bank robbers are the ones doing it. Uh, and it shows the American lack of interest in horror. So this is the, this would be the same time that Nosferatu is being made. It would be the year that Cabinet of Dr. Caligari has come out. Uh, it's right around the time that The Gullum uh, is made. Uh, it's after a French film called J'accuse uh, that showed the Great War dead actually rising from their graves uh, and, and, and coming back in sort of zombie-like fashion to accuse their fellow countrymen of betraying them. Uh, so meanwhile, in the United States, uh, in what was just emerging as Hollywood land, Hollywood, there is an emphasis not on the frightening supernatural, not on what we would call horror at all, but rather a kind of slapstick that occasionally used supernatural themes, but only for fun. That was very, very soon going to change. So how is it then that horror came to America? Well, European influences had a lot to do with it, and one particular studio that was open to these influences had a lot to do with it, and that was Universal Studios. Uh, Universal uh, ha had its origins in the 1910s. Carl Lamely, who actually himself was a German immigrant, uh, had begun the studio. His son, Carl Amelie Jr., who, who everyone simply called Jr., was the one who was really interested in European horror and had the idea that this could become very popular in the United States. So, for example, um, Lon Chaney, uh, who was a huge star in the 1920s and was known for playing a number of different villainous characters, a number of different villainous and deformed characters, 
He played uh, the Phantom of the Opera in Universal Studios' 1925 film of the same name. Now, Carl Amelie Sr. was not entirely convinced that Americans were up for horror. He thought that, uh, and you can understand from this, from kind of the atmosphere in America after the Great War, he thought it was too dark, he thought it was too gruesome. He even told his son that, here's that word again, um, uh, Americans just aren't interested in that morbid stuff. Junior, luckily for monster fans everywhere, was able to convince his dad otherwise. And he did that in part uh, because he's actually the one who encouraged uh, his father to have Universal Studios produce and make uh, the now uh, classic film based on the classic novel, All Quiet on the Western Front. So actually the success of that film, the critical success of that film, which Universal Studios was not really uh, used to producing uh, films that, that film critics took notice of, but they certainly did with, with All Quiet. And so it was indeed a uh, World War I film that opened the way to the idea of horror. And that would come in a big way early in 1931 uh, with Todd Browning, who had often worked with Lon Chaney, directing uh, the Hungarian immigrant, uh, now American citizen, Bela Lugosi in Dracula. Now, Dracula proved to be a gigantic success. And Lugosi, of course, today is completely identified in so many ways with the character. Uh, Lugosi brought uh, European influences and indeed the influence of the Great War. Lugosi had been an officer in the Austro-Hungarian army. Uh, he had been wounded. Uh, he had suffered uh, what on the West, in the, the Western powers referred to as, as shell shock or war neurosis, and there's a lot of evidence that he channeled a lot of that trauma into his horror roles, including Dracula. Now, not everyone was sort of officially happy with Dracula appearing on the American scene. Uh, they said that it was, uh, it was terrible for children, uh, that it was uh, the outgrowth of sick minds, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, everybody also seemed to be going to see Dracula, uh, and it, it proved enormously popular, although it was not the film that really turned Universal Studios into the House of Monsters. That's the one that we're going to talk about next. So, in 1931, same year that uh, Dracula is released on the world, uh, a up-and-coming director at Universal Studios, originally from Britain, himself actually, again, uh, like uh, some of the other horror greats that we have talked about, a veteran of the Great War, a lieutenant in the British Army, James Whale, was asked to make a film adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. He did so, it came out in late 1931, and did even better than Dracula in terms of convincing audiences that maybe some of this morbid stuff that Carl Lamely worried about was actually great fun. And so Frankenstein really turns Universal Studios into the House of Monsters. Um, it is an incredibly gruesome story. It doesn't quite affect us uh, in the same way today as it did audiences in 1931. I suppose there's no way that it, it really can, but the conception of it is truly terrifying. And I think that the early audiences who encountered this notion of someone who had not simply, had not, 
reanimated the dead, had not sort of brought the dead back to life or raised or evoked some kind of ghost, but someone who had actually taken body parts, right? Yeah, I know. It's actually taken body parts, stitched them together, and sent it lumbering forth into the world. Uh, this was an incredibly frightening conception. And it came right at a moment when some of that optimism of the 1920s had faded. In fact, for many Americans, it had disappeared completely. The 1929 crash of the stock market, the Great Depression, a time of economic ruin. Uh, it was a time period in which there was enormous anxiety in the United States, just like there's enormous anxiety today, and, uh, and over some of the same kinds of reasons. Americans were simply more ready for horror. History had run over them, had hit them in the face in the early 1930s. Uh, and so Dracula um, and his, what has been called his dark twin Frankenstein come just at the ideal moment to channel some of those fears. So this particular image shows you James Whale uh, and uh, also uh, Boris Karloff. This is actually an image from The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, James Whale did one follow-up that many people consider to actually be much better than the original, to be better than the 1931 film. Uh, it has a lot of dark humor along with real horror. And one of James Whale's contributions was to be able to bring those two things together that just had really been very, very separate in the American mind. Uh, you could have those European weird films, or you could have the Harold Lloyd Buster Keaton tradition of spooks, ghosts, all played for laughs. What James Whale did, and this is how he actually described it, is he created what he called a comedy about death uh, in The Bride of Frankenstein. So I want to say actually a little bit more about Whale and his influence of, over the iconic image uh, of Frankenstein that, of course, plays a prominent role in the exhibit, an exhibit, after all, called It's Alive, uh, maybe the most famous film in horror, f uh, famous line in horror film history, one of the most famous film lines ever uh, that comes from these James Whale films. So um, I wanted to give you some more time here in my haunted lair. This is actually my desk where I watch horror films, think about horror films, and write about horror films. Uh, and as you can see, I am joined by my friend here, the Frankenstein's monster, uh, a, uh, a scale model that is actually based, of course, on Boris Karloff and his extraordinary performance. So I thought that uh, perhaps we would uh, talk a little bit about the making of the monster because there's a partially true, partially fake story that you often hear about the creation of the monster that really has become an iconic image. I mean, if you see this image, there's no two-year-old in the world probably that does not know that this is indeed Frankenstein. So wh why was he designed in this way? I mean, Mary Shelley, uh, if you have read the novel, you know that she describes the creature in quite, quite different terms. Well, there's a couple of things going on with the very interesting makeup here. First of all, Jack Pierce, who was the makeup artist who did most of the monster makeups for all of Universal Studios' classic monsters, had um, a, a lot to do, many would argue, and I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about this, many would argue he had the lion's share to do with the design of the monster. Certainly, he's the one who uh, sat Boris Karloff down for several hours every morning to put this makeup together and figured out how to do it. But in terms of the design, we actually know uh, that James Whale also played 
an important role in it. We know this in a couple of ways. First of all, Whale, as a director, uh, was also kind of his own art director and cinematographer. He designed almost every aspect of the mise-en-scene of his films. Uh, and so there's uh, descriptions of how he would actually draw, he was also a very accomplished artist, um, he would actually draw the, the drapes in Castle Frankenstein and what they ought to look like. Um, so sketches of the monster um, have been attributed to him by people who actually worked on the set. He also talked about how he wanted to give a very distinctive look to the monster that brought together both the idea of this is an organic creature and this is also a creature that has been, you know, stitched together and brought to life uh, by electricity. Uh, and so you have the famous bolts uh, in the neck. Uh, the stitches uh, that are in the head. Uh, and in fact, an idea that seems to have come from Whale himself, um, that the head should be flat uh, because as a surgeon, uh, Dr. Frankenstein would have sort of dropped the brain into the head. Um, and a quote sometimes attributed to Whale although it may actually come uh, from the wonderful novel Gods and Monsters uh, by Christopher Bram, but sometimes it is attributed also to Whale, um, is that uh, Frankenstein could roll the head back and, and, and drop the brain in as if it was a bit of tinned beef, uh, is the way that it's put. So, in any case, um, whoever uh, gets the most credit for the design of the monster I think that it's one of the great iconic images of the last 100 years. So by 1935, when The Bride of Frankenstein appeared, uh, it certainly seemed like Americans had gotten over their early revulsion uh, and uh, so questions about whether or not horror was good entertainment. Uh, certainly, uh, there are always uh, moralists who are uh, sniffing and clutching their pearls and being upset, but um, the, the monster movies were hugely popular with really a cross-section of the American public, and other studios were producing some of the classic films as well um, so that we get King Kong, uh, in the same era that we get Dracula, Frankenstein, the Invisible Man. Um, it is true that by the late 1930s, horror had dropped off in its popularity just a bit. Now, in 1938, it did, after uh, kind of a, a, a brief uh, drought, uh, in 1938, exhibitors, uh, one particular exhibitor in Los Angeles, got the idea of offering the original two Universal Studio monster films, if you don't count Phantom, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein together on the same bill. And this became huge. Um, soon, uh, movie theaters all over the country were booking this double bill, uh, and it kind of brought the monsters roaring back. Um, this was good for Universal Studios that had actually gone into receivership in the Great Depression. In fact, uh, Carl Lamely and Carl Lamely Jr. were no longer in control of the studio, and the new owners, uh, many of them who didn't uh, really knew very little about the f about films, they were connected to various Wall Street firms and and others that were making money off of the Great Depression, as Wall Street firms tend to do uh, during hard economic times. They didn't think much of of the monsters, thought that the, maybe that was passe or kid stuff, 1938 showed them different. And so in 1939, you've got Boris Karloff coming back to play in The Son of Frankenstein, playing again the monster. And then another one of Universal Studios' classic monsters, The Wolfman that appears in 1941. The Wolfman is also a European import. Kurt Sidmack, uh, 
uh, the screenwriter who created the story and really sort of shepherded the story into a film uh, was an emigre from Germany, had had to leave Ger Hitler's Germany in 1933, uh, along with his brother, also a filmmaker, Robert Sidmack. And Kurt Sidmack wrote the film uh, the Wolfman, it starred Claude Rains, who had been the Invisible Man. It starred Bella Lugosi in an unfortunately small role. And um, it also starred Lon Chaney in the lead role as the Wolfman, Lon Chaney Jr. So the, the great Lon Chaney from the 1920s had died in 1930, had died young in 1930. He had actually been, at one time been on track to play Dracula. Um, but um, his son, who actually was named Crichton Chaney, but uh, worked as Lon Chaney Jr., took the role of The Wolfman. Now, The Wolfman is an incredibly interesting film for the moment that it comes out and what it does. Unlike a lot of Universal Studios films, it is set in a contemporary period. It's not set in the United States, but we know from the clothes, we know from the cars, uh, we know from the phones, we know from other kinds of technology that it is present day. Uh, it's sort of 1940s England. Now, the interesting thing about it is it's a 1940s England where, as Evelyn Ankers, who co-starred with Cheney, said, everybody knows about werewolves, and yet nobody seems to know that the London Blitz is going on. Nobody seems to know that World War II is happening. This is interesting because so many of the earliest European horror films had taken politics very, very seriously. I had talked earlier about how Murnau and Grau saw Nosferatu as something close to an allegory for the Great War itself. The American monster tradition, particularly by the 1940s, not so much early on with James Whale, but by the 1940s, it was becoming more and more escapist. And Americans had a, a, a real need to escape during this time because of the interesting moment that it appears. The Wolfman actually comes out just a couple of weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The next six months into 1942 are really going to be some of the darkest months for the Allies um, and for the United States, having just entered the war uh, of, the, of, of the entire 1939 to 1945 period. Uh, and so the Wolfman offered a kind of monstrous fantasy, a kind of monstrous escape, um, and the idea that had already been present in all of the early films of the monster that could be sympathetic, that you would actually sympathize with their plight, that you would feel for them as much as you would be scared of them. And this would be really important for explaining why you would end up with a collection like you're able to see um, online in the It's Alive exhibit, um, why the, the monsters would become something like friends um, very scary friends to not just one, but several generations of kids. And in fact, they would be called, as we're going to learn next, the Monster Kids. The monsters uh, of, the, of the classic movies actually had a big comeback by the 1960s. Now, we think of the 40s and the 50s as mainly the time that horror began to explore the idea of alien invasion and uh, different kinds of mutated monsters, often by radiation. And that's absolutely true, but the fandom for these early classic films of American horror never went away. Uh, and in fact, it, with the new generation, with the baby boomer generation, it actually came roaring back. And from the 1960s uh, until about 1980, you have what's often referred to as the monster kid generation. Uh, this is a good example of the kind of thing that the monster kids were into. Uh, this is an advertisement that appeared in the late 60s in Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. 
uh, a magazine that became a kind of flagship publication for the Monster Kids, that the, the letters page for it became something like a virtual community uh, before the emergence, long before the emergence of the internet, a kind of virtual community of monster lovers where uh, you could write in, send your photograph, talk about your favorite films. And uh, the question, of course, is how were they, how were they seeing these classic films? Well, um, that's actually as part of the phenomena that, that, that kicked off the Monster Kid craze was that Universal Studios packaged um, about 50 of their films, um, including Dracula, including Frankenstein, including The Bride of Frankenstein, um, as well as a number of films that we wouldn't really think of as, as monster features, but would, would rather, rather be thought of as suspense and crime. But as the genre was kind of coming together, they, it was really mishmashed in a lot of ways. And so anything uh, that presented s suspense was kind of put into the, the shock theater package. And this package of films was, sh was sold to... Uh, individual television stations all over the country who would air these films on Saturday afternoons, late at night, um, as shock theater, sometimes with a host um, who would do various kinds of puns, who would often play a character, um, Zachary the Cool Ghoul of Philadelphia and then New York City is one of the most famous of these. Uh, this proved so popular that uh, Universal was Studios actually sold kind of a second passage, uh, a package of films that they called Son of Shock. So you could watch these these uh, films from the 1930s on television uh, in the 1960s um, into the 1970s, uh, and yet there was still something very very special about them in the age long before either VHS. Uh, or Blu-ray or streaming, where now we can see anything we would want pretty much at any time, uh, there was still this very special experience uh, that I myself can remember from the 1970s uh, when in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, Shock Theater came on on Saturday afternoons, every Saturday afternoon right at lunch. And it was always, you know, what's going to be uh, the monster movie of the week. So there was some excitement about it. It had some of the exci excitement of going to the films and seeing the films for the first time. And so there's an explosion of interest in monsters that I think in some ways is, is still with us. Uh, so many of the great filmmakers that we connect with horror and science fiction and science fiction horror today um, uh, were monster kids. So uh, Peter Jackson, uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, some names that may not be as familiar to you but are important in, in the horror world like John Landis, uh, George Romero, Night of the Living Dead, definitely, and the Dead trilogy, definitely a monster kid who fell in love with these movies um, who read Famous Monsters magazine, uh, and who really made the American horror tradition, um, would make it into what it is today. A long, long way uh, from the period in which it was just sort of all played for fun, uh, that it was all Scooby-Doo stories. Um, and in a way, uh, it's understandable that the monster films took this trajectory that horror has become more and more popular. Um, it reflects the darkness of the times of the late 20th, early 21st century and our own moment, um, much more than that really naive sense of optimism that Americans felt and some Americans felt in 1918, 1919, 1920. Uh, so the monsters remain with us, uh, sometimes as friends, sometimes as omens, sometimes as portents, uh, but always uh, interwoven with our culture, uh, with our films, in our dreams, uh, and of course in our nightmares. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with me today in the Haunted Lair. Um, and I did want to show you, uh, these are a couple of examples of 
famous monsters of Filmland magazine from my own collection, uh, one of them from my own youth, one of them uh, from my continuing childhood that I bought uh, more recently as I continue to be a monster kid. As I said at the beginning, um, do go on and take a look at the uh, museum's uh, e exhibition page. Uh, read some of the essays, uh, watch some of the other videos, um, and enjoy that. Also, if you have been interested in uh, some of the things that I've talked about, you can read more um, in my book, Wasteland, The Great War and the Origins of Modern Horror, where I take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the individual figures that I've talked about. Um, also, if you're interested in horror hosts, um, I wrote a biography of Vampyra, uh, who was the original horror host, uh, so that you can read about that. And then there is also my book, Monsters in America. Uh, at this time, please buy uh, those books from an indie bookstore. Uh, you can buy those from IndieBound.org uh, or uh, any independent bookstore. Many of them are set up nowadays so that you can order online. So uh, thanks very much for spending some time uh, with me and my monsters. I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I have.